Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... At Villarese Florist, we deliver the magic of flowers seven days a week to the North Shore and South Shore in the New Orleans area. Whether it's for birthday parties, baby celebrations, Villarese provides colorful floral displays for all. With a store full of fresh cut flowers, exotic tropical flowers, orchids, roses, and even fruit baskets, our goal is to make your vision a reality. Villarese Florist, proudly serving Louisiana since 1969. Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House has been shocking here since 1979. Located at 3117 21st Street in Metairie, Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House offers raw, fried, and grilled oysters as well as a range of Cajun and Creole dishes. Enjoy a dozen with a smile. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host Eric Asher. Over the next hour we talk about all the home teams. The uh, New Orleans Saints, the New Orleans Pelicans, LSU, also Tulane and UNO. Got a great panel to break it down from CrescentCitySports.com. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If that's not on your favorites, if you're a sports fan and you're not checking out CrescentCitySports.com, you're not keeping up what's going on here in New Orleans Sports. Uh, but we got two great uh, guests today. Award-winning journalist Les East joins us on the program, along with Jude Young, the voice of UN Athletics. Both gentlemen are with CrestedSports.com. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being with us. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing well, Eric. Thanks for having me back. Always good to have you, Les. Uh, and of course, we always like to leave out a little bit more time for you, so you can let <laughs> folks know about uh, what you're involved in and uh, tell folks how they can keep up with uh, Les East. Well, of course, uh, as you mentioned, CrescentCitySports.com is probably where uh, I'm featured most prominently these days. But uh, SaturdayDownSouth.com, uh, cover LSU for them. Of course, the spring game's coming up on Saturday in Tiger Stadium. And uh, some other news been going on around the LSU yeah, Athletic Department we may discuss at some point. Uh, also writing for The Advocate, the daily Iberian, mm -hmm. Iberian newspaper in New Iberia. And uh, they can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter at Les underscore East. And you sleep about two hours a night, right? Sometimes. Yeah, that's what I'm figuring, <laughs> all that, no doubt. Jude, welcome back. Of course, Jude, uh, an integral part of CrestedSports.com, also voice of UNO. How you doing? I'm doing great. Of course, we know, being in the business, that sleep is very much overrated, yes. so we don't even worry about that. But we have so much to keep us busy. For me, CrescentCitySports.com on a day-to-day basis is number one on the list. Eric mentioned broadcasting UNO basketball season, mm -hmm. just wrapping up another successful one with 19 wins out on the lakefront. And I do a radio show a couple of days a week on 990 AM WGSO at six o'clock <clears throat> Tuesdays and on Fridays, part of what Ken Trahan and I do there for nightly sports talk on that station. Yep, do a great job as well. Always look forward to uh, checking out your show on the radio. Guys, let's start off with LSU. Some breaking news on Will Wade, Ross Dellinger of Sports Illustrated, former The Advocate, put out a story today talking about that Will Wade is willing to be able to sit down with LSU now uh, with the NCAA in tow. So the NCAA will be uh, in, in, involved in these meetings. Uh, it will be probably with King Alexander, the president of the university, uh, athletic director Joe Oliva. Uh, we remember that, again, the, uh, he had turned that down on advice of his attorney. Well. He's, gotten, uh, he's moved on from that attorney. That attorney was a defense attorney. Uh, instead, he's, uh, he has um, uh, retained Stephen Thompson out of Chicago. He is an NCAA-type lawyer. He understands the inner, work, inner workings of the NCAA. Uh, he has um, been the attorney for Bruce Pearl, for Sean Miller, Bill Self, all of that issues with, with the NCAA in the past, uh, and uh, is now considered, as uh, now from uh, what Ross uh, Dellinger had to say on Corey Johnson's show this afternoon, 
Uh, it is a matter of hours and days in which uh, LSU will meet with Will Wade uh, rather than months. Of course, this is on the cusp of the April 22nd uh, trial that's coming up. With it. There is a possibility uh, that there may be a settlement in that trial and Will Wade will not have to testify. But I will caution everybody to think that it's over if he doesn't testify. Um, I read an article recently that said that the NCAA has asked the FBI to turn over uh, all, all the investigation that they have done in, into, again, the scandals in college basketball. So just because there is not, not going to maybe be a trial or, or any type of um, testimony by Will Wade, that doesn't necessarily mean that the NCAA won't get the information that the FBI has, has been able to uh, cultivate over these uh, many months and years. Les, I'll take you first. This is kind of um, earth-shaking, so to speak, because I think a lot of us thought that it was fait complete. Will Wade's not going to meet with LSU. At some point, LSU's got to make a decision here with recruiting, with guys that are thinking about uh, leaving in terms of retention to the program. I mean, how long can you wait on Will Wade at this point? And then the fact that he had been so adamant about not meeting with his bosses, okay, again, that he had, there was a possibility uh, and from what I was hearing, they were working on a buyout that there was going to be a possible firing for, 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 for cause, which would mean they would not have to pay him. So there's a lot of different scenarios out there. But this kind of maybe changes the, the, uh, the landscape a little bit, bringing in a lawyer who, again, understands the idiosyncrasies of the NCAA. Yeah, there's a lot going on here, and, and it's probably going to change dramatically uh, over the coming days. Uh, but a couple of things strike me. One, I think... Uh, Will Wade has definitely upgraded his legal representation with this guy from Chicago. Now he, instead of just saying, I'm not going to talk to LSU, he's trying to work something out. Circumstances probably have something to do with that, but nonetheless, I think it's in Will Wade's best interest not to be seen as a guy who's stonewalling his employers, which he's been doing for the last month. So I think he's probably in better hands legally than he was previously. Uh, I think if this case gets settled, that's probably good for Will Wade and for LSU, even though, as you pointed out, if the FBI turns over what it has to the NCAA, there could still be sanctions for one or both parties, but I, it might reduce the amount of dirty laundry that gets aired publicly, yes. which would be helpful in the future uh, for both entities. Uh, the, I, I think time is of the essence, both for Will Wade and for LSU. The, the one thing that bothers me about this, that has bothered me about this since it happened uh, a month ago, is none of this seems to have anything to do with the possibility of Will Wade being innocent. Right. It's all about how do we massage this circumstance right. to everybody's satisfaction. He's on tape. Say, talking about an offer that was made to a high school athlete. Now, unless there's something <coughs> I can't comprehend mm -hmm. here, he's on tape saying he was trying to buy a player to come to LSU. Right. And if that's true, I don't see how LSU can bring him back, though it looks like that is a better possibility than it was a couple of days ago. But I think the most important fact, the most important aspect of this entire thing is getting lost in all this other stuff. Right. Did he do it or not? That's what I want to know. It sure looks like he did it. Right. And, and, and you and I discussed this before I go to you, Jude, before the show. <clears throat> this is about the fear of the next Nick Saban. <clears throat> that Will Wade, okay, <clears throat> will, will do a repeat of what Bruce Pearl has done at Auburn uh, <clears throat> to Tennessee. Gets in trouble at Tennessee. Tennessee has to, has to deal with the issues. He moves on. A little bit of a suspension. He <clears throat> goes to Auburn. Auburn's in the Final Four. Uh, Nick Saban, considered the greatest college football coach maybe of all time. Again, LSU, former LSU coach. He goes to Miami. He comes back. He's the coach of the University of Alabama, and he resuscitates that once great program. Uh, the last thing they want to do is allow an up-and-coming coach who looks like he's a guy that could be one of the better coaches in the NCAA to let him get away to one day be able to be coaching at another SEC school after he pays his penance. So from LSU standpoint, they don't want another situation of a Nick Saban repeat, although it's a little bit different circumstances right. because of the fact that he's on, an, he's on an FBI wiretap. Right. And it's also different because uh, Nick Saban chose to leave LSU. Absolutely. And, and LSU had a coach when he decided to come back to True. college. Although there were some out there that were saying, <laughs> even after Les Miles won a national championship, fire Les, bring, bring Nick back. Right. 
Um, but the other thing is this situation is complicated by the fact that you have an athletic director at LSU and Joe Oliva who does not have much job security himself. True. And how this situation plays out could be the final straw for his tenure if it doesn't play out well for the university and the athletic so department. So some self-preservation there as well, right? Sure. And, and, and most people, I think, would act the same way in, mm -hmm. in his situation. If you had someone who was unfireable as your athletic director, I think their approach to this might be different. So mm -hmm. that complicates things quite a bit, yeah. I think. By the way, Joe Lee, in the last year of his deal, uh, there were rumors out there he was looking for an opportunity to get an extension. Uh, that was not given to him uh, when um, Ed Ogeron got his extension. Jude, you have the floor. What do you have to say about this? Well, I think you've covered a lot of the key ground, but we have to take into account the the very environment of what major college athletics are, men's basketball and football. It's like the 1970s Oakland Raiders. Rule one, cheating is encouraged. It was on the wall in the <laughs> locker room. That's what the climate is of these sports. And there's nobody out there who doesn't realize it now. And certainly the fans realize it. And LSU fans are adamant and clearly pro Will Wade because they're more upset with him for getting caught than they are that he was right. doing it and built an SEC championship team. And we're looking at a Final Four right now where the NCAA has to deal with Bruce Pearl, not just a suspension. He's the first coach to ever receive a show clause from the NCAA and then come back and lead a team to the Final Four because that is the environment we're in. So that does sort of tell you, because at first I thought about it before this Auburn run, it really didn't hit me. I thought, well, Will Wade's compromised now. If it's a cheating coach's game at the high levels then he can't cheat now right even if he somehow gets away with this allegedly what he said what we think he did right. and now I realize well wait a second yeah and, and so do LSU fans they don't want the next superstar coach to get away because if this is the environment that we're in then this 36 year old coach could have a long career of great success because look how quickly he turned LSU into a winner but the other part of it that's important to take into account is with this change of representation for Wade there's the federal problem and then there's the NCAA problem. Yes. And they're two completely different things as far as the future of Will Wade. And one can guess without knowing for sure, and maybe more will come out about it, that he's made this change because the federal problem is probably going to go away, mm -hmm. that he's gotten enough information that it looks like a settlement and nothing more is going to come out, including who knows if there were ever words that, that dollar amounts were mentioned or <coughs> gifts were mentioned or whatever it could be with that strong blank offer yes. that was reported to be mm -hmm. on tape. So now he can turn his attention to the NCA, and that means meeting with LSU because LSU officials have insisted from the start that if he was going to meet with them and talk about it, he was going to meet with an NCA representative as well because it is all about compliance. So the fact that he's turning his attention towards that means now LSU is in the compromising position of we may not have enough on him to fire with cause and that's what he's trying to avoid. So now it's about his future, avoiding a show clause, and of mm -hmm. course, keeping those checks coming, mm -hmm. whether they're from LSU or somebody else quickly thereafter. Let, let me add something Absolutely. quickly, and, and I agree <clears throat> with you about the, the context within which the, this plays out. College right. athletics, especially college basketball, is in no way a pure environment, okay? Um, and, and this is, that's a realistic approach to it. What I would like to see, and, and the lawyers are going to have to work out how much payment would be involved and whether there's cause and all this stuff, but LSU is an institute of higher learning and a good one. Right. Okay, how can you allow the third, fourth, fifth most prominent employee of the university to be seen nationally as a cheater and say, we're going to bring him back and allow him to continue mm -hmm. working here. What kind of message does that send to the student body that you're educating and to the taxpayers of Louisiana who are paying you to educate their children? I just wish somebody would look at it in that context and say, this is wrong. He doesn't represent LSU the way we want LSU to be represented. He has to go. I think they are looking at it that way, though. But there's the other issue, which is LSU <coughs> athletics within Louisiana State University is actually a business, a business that every year is now giving back millions of dollars to campus. And it's a business upon which a lot of the fundraising, both for athletics and the university, is built. And here you have Joe Oliva in the middle. And I'm going to go on record right now and say he's going 
going to end up being a fall guy here, no matter what happens with Will Wade. I don't see him being yep. the athletic director in 2020, period. He's trying to do the right thing. I believe that F. King Alexander, who runs the university, wants the right thing done. But at the same time, not only does he have to worry about LSU athletics being supported by the fans slash donors mm -hmm. slash ticket buyers moving forward, but LSU is about to start a big fundraising campaign again yes. for the next wave of improvements mm -hmm. and needs. And because there's so much crossover between supporter of the university mm -hmm. and supporter of the LSU Tigers, mm -hmm. they're dealing with a very slippery situation. So it's not right that's mm -hmm. winning out here. It's money that's winning out here. And, and that's the point I'm pointing out, that it, it's the big picture. And somebody's going to take the fall, and LSU's going to come out of this not smelling like a rose, but being able to move forward and keep that money coming in. And just to piggyback on one thing real quick, uh, you're right, but the men's, mm -hmm. when we're talking about income, we're talking about donors who, according to Ross's mm -hmm. story, have made it known that they will withdraw support to the athletic program yes. if Will Wade is fired. Right. Because exactly. the, the men's basketball program in LSU has been terrible right. until Will Wade came Absolutely. along and revived it for one year. Mm -hmm. So it's not a big money maker, and mm -hmm. you can get somebody else to come in. So the success of the men's basketball program isn't really a monetary issue. It's the fact that donors are essentially right. blackmailing the university but that into is retaining the money. a crook. That is the money part of the issue, and you just mentioned the key point. LSU basketball since Dale Brown has had two or three spike seasons mm -hmm. and been a loser mm -hmm. other than that and hasn't brought fans into the building. So fans have gotten a taste of winning in 26 mm -hmm. games and winning the SEC and beating Kentucky in Rupp Arena, which happens once every Haley's Comet passing, and they right. want more. Those donors have gotten a taste of it, and they're greedy for mm -hmm. more. Well, and, and, and I'll use three words for you on why they went way, way back. Just win, baby. Mm -hmm. Okay, you talk so about the Oakland Reds. Raiders. I mean, it's the truth. I mean, that's the, it is winning. But I will say this, and I think we've all discussed this on my radio show. We've had a chance to discuss this on and off the air. That's fine and dandy unless the uh, NCAA comes in and, and, and says lack of institutional control. Right. If they say that, and they're going, LSU's done everything in their power now, inviting the NCAA to these meetings, we're trying to cooperate, want to make sure. If they stub their nose and say, we're keeping him, much like Arizona did with Sean Miller, much like Kansas done with Bill Self, uh, then, at, then at that point, if they want to come in and say lack of institutional control, well, they'll let the basketball program burn to ashes because they're not allowing them to go in and, and start investigating each and every program, especially the football program, which, as you've mentioned, is the cash cow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and it, it's complicated, and I think there's some tricky decisions that have to be made here, here and I think the lawyers from LSU's side are earning their money because they have to navigate some tricky landscape here in terms of what can you, how can you justify getting rid of Will Wade if you choose to go that route yes. and how can you justify keeping him if you choose to go that route. And, uh, I, I, but the, the key thing is the NCAA. LSU from day one has done everything it could to try and mitigate potential NCAA That's punishment. Right. And now it looks like they may be softening their approach to that, which is a very tricky situation if they decide to go that way. But I don't think LSU's ignorant. I think there have been talks behind the scenes involving the NCAA. Sure. And I know Mark Emmert during mm -hmm. the NCAA tournament, which is their huge cash cow with the multi-billion dollar TV sure. contract, he said, well, we want that FBI information, as you mentioned, so we can move forward. But at the same time, how much does the NCAA really want that? Because it is men's college basketball and it is the organization's main cash cow. It's not football. Right. Folks sometimes get that it's confused. It, the NCAA's money comes from the basketball right. contract first and foremost and primarily. So how much do they want to open Pandora's box and, and hurt and kill Will Wade's career and get him talking? Right. What, what benefit mm -hmm. is that to the NCAA? Because he could potentially point a lot of fingers in a lot of directions to a lot of blue blood programs that the NCAA doesn't want to have to deal with. I think they're right. going to be very businesslike about this too. And we've seen them do that in issues like North Carolina mm -hmm. on the basketball right. side and, and Miami with the football mm -hmm. side and using mistakes and, and ambiguities to, to bail out and not put right. those schools on probation and open up what could be bigger cauldrons that could point to other schools. Couldn't agree more. Again, uh, uh, as you mentioned, when you talk about the cheating and, and, and what's going on between AAU, between the handlers, between what's going on uh, with the shoe companies, 
Uh, again, the NCAA is not stupid, okay? If we hear it and we're in the media and the, the fans hear it, uh, again, there's been proof out there of what's happened in the past. Uh, they don't want, much like, uh, again, uh, in football, they don't want the blue bloods to go down in football. They definitely don't want to open up Pandora's box by having this trial where, again, it could expose some blue bloods. And then, again, there goes college basketball. they got a big issue on, on their hands right now with the possibility of the NBA allowing 18-year-olds to go directly to the, to the NBA where they're losing these, quote-unquote, stars out of high school now, even if they were one and dunners. Uh, you know, that's going to be a different situation going forward. Uh, when, when you look at this overall, how do you think it plays out, Les? How do you think, do you think that, uh, I mean, uh, again, Jude's on the record mm -hmm. saying is the fall guy, and, and I, I agree with that as well. I don't see Joe Oliva uh, being retained here uh, it, either way. Um, but do you think Will Wade is going to be coaching at LSU again? Um, before you showed me Ross's story, I would have said no way. Uh, now I will say there's a possibility of mm -hmm. it. I don't know. One thing I'm intrigued by is the degree to which F. King Alexander seems to be involved in this. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I think that does put a different perspective into the front line of the negotiations, at least that's the way it appears, as opposed to just having the athletic director handle it. Uh, my guess from what we've learned from this story is that there is a reasonable possibility that they work out an arrangement whereby Will Wade does return, mm -hmm. which I don't think is the right thing, um, but I think there's a good chance it happens, and I do think there's a very good chance what you said about Joe Oliva ultimately being mm -hmm. the fall guy yes. for this. Right. And just one thing, let me sure. say this real Please. quickly, I Take can't not say this, just to show what we're dealing with here. This whole thing started because Will Wade is on a phone conversation that the FBI gets wind of where he's talking to a broker yes. for a high school student. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that we have a de facto agent yeah. negotiating for a high school basketball player to get him the best deal to go to college demonstrates what a farce this entire thing is. No, it's no longer amateur athletics. Right. There's no doubt about it. And that's why the it's FBI business. is investigating Absolutely. the middlemen. Yeah. They weren't going after Will no. Wade. He just happened to be the guy right. caught in the crossfire by his own negligence, if you want to call Ignorance it that. Ignorance is what it's I call what it. Is. From, from, you, you don't see the John Calipari's no in the way. world who leave school and probations in their wake and wind up getting better jobs mm -hmm. on the college level get caught on tape. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, and I agree with what, exactly what Les said, is the, the end game here could very well play out that way because I'm starting to believe that there's not anything else on tape that's concrete. Mm -hmm. And he can argue it away saying Javante Smart, the player in question, was a hometown kid and that offer included because he was a hometown kid. He was on tape saying to try to take care of the mm -hmm. family. He can basically, if you want to call mm -hmm. it lying, call it lying. He can talk his way through that and say it had nothing to do with money and illegal benefits. Right. He can say that. Sure. Why? Because mm -hmm. if you don't have anything concrete right. and, and, and the FBI ongoing, backs off, right then what do you have? You have a coach that the fans love that they want to keep yep. and, it, and tie a lot of money to that that the school needs. But the other, the person on the other end of the phone who is trying to settle this out of yeah. court, this, this case in Griffin Arizona, Dolphin. he's already in jail, isn't yes. he? He's, yeah, already, he's already, been already been convicted, convicted once. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I'd like to know what he has yeah. to say about yeah. all this. Um, also goes to show you the power of the donors the power and the influence of the Board of Supervisors, mm -hmm. how the Board of Supervisors is influenced by the donors, and then the politics that's wrapped up in this as well with Governor John Bell Edwards, again, having, going to have a big say in this one way or the other going forward. If you remember, John Bell Edwards was asked about Will Wade uh, being fired, and, and he, he even threw caution to the wind. Let's not, let's not put the cart before the horse. Um, again, I'm paraphrasing here. Right. It's an entire pyramid, though, we're talking about. Not just the big money donors at the top, but many phone calls mm -hmm. and emails coming from Joe Fan that were angry about Absolutely. Will Wade being suspended. Was it 50 to 1, 50 to uh, 2? Oh, it was unreal. Yeah. I mean, the support is top to bottom, and, and the Board of Regents is hearing it. Mm-hmm. And they're hearing it often, and they're starting to align with, well, we need to keep the, 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 all these factions happy. Now, you can say that whether that's right or wrong, and, and, and you can lean in a certain direction. I do, too. But I certainly understand what they're thinking, mm -hmm. because never forget, it's about the money first. That's why I keep bringing it up, and uh, money's the reason why this mess happened in the first place. Right. Money <laughs> and winning. And winning. And winning. Well, yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. If LSU was 12 and 16 this year, right. Will Wade would have been gone oh, no, five no, weeks ago. He would have been gone ago. in October. Oh. Uh -huh.
Come on, yeah, as soon as yeah, they found out about you're right, he would have been gone in October. Yeah, but he had already signed the third best recruiting class in the country, right. and those tend to win right away. So yeah. he kept his job. No, no doubt about it. I didn't get that. I didn't answer for you. Will Wade coaches again at LSU? As of right now, I'm going to say yes, just because I don't think anything else is going yeah. to come out, and that's just the environment that we're in. Last week, I would have said no way. Right. No mm -hmm. way, no Me how. He has, he has coached his last game at LSU. they got to figure out an end game here. Uh, you can't let these players start to, start to, to defect on. you got to have retention. you got to worry about recruiting. Uh, now, <clears throat> I'm leaning toward Will Wade is going to coach But here's one LSU. last thing to ask. For the fans who really want him to say, because all they care, they care about is winning, I ask you, well, now since he's been caught and is in a position where he probably has to be a good boy for a little mm -hmm. while, assuming he was doing the things we think he was doing, how effective is he going to be getting these top recruits to come to campus? Well, you just said he's going to be smart, okay? And, and, and I think smart is... Uh, Not Javante. Uh, no, no. A, a confidant, right. okay, who is uh, uh, his guy who will never turn on him, mm -hmm. okay, that they will be making the deals from now on. Probably. He will be smart enough that he will never be caught on another wiretap. He won't be talking mm -hmm. to Christian Dawkins. Again, I think his biggest problem was this is what he has done in the past. This was his track record. He did it as an assistant coach, okay? And, mm -hmm. and But when you become a head coach, there has to be a line of demarcation here. And uh, let's not fool ourselves. I know you're the you're the idealist here, and you think from a from a uh, you know this is a higher education. This is about a, this is a university. No, I agree with uh, with Jude. It's big business, and it's nope. about winning. So, it's so should we it. so should we look online and see if something comes up on a job site about Will Wade's personal assistant? It might be our next step you up know, to fame and you fortune, know, again, or at look, least fortune. Look look for the guy who is <laughs> his guy who's been with him forever, and that will be the guy. And I'm sure you can look at every staff. In, in terms of college basketball, and there's that guy on the staff. Right. I mean, we had a situation like that with Ohio State, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the guy that would never turn on the head coach and went down in flames rather than turn on the head coach. And that guy, whoever he might be, will be the most scrutinized assistant basketball coach in America. Totally agree. Keeping this going for a few minutes, Tony Benford goes to Texas A&M. Your reaction? Uh, good for him. Uh, he, he got out of a situation that's uh, 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 fluid at best. And, uh, you know, I think everybody in the college basketball world has to be impressed by the way he handled himself agree. under the circumstances um, at LSU. Uh, he wasn't up to beating Tom Izzo in the Sweet 16, but a lot of people haven't been up to beating Tom Izzo in the Sweet 16. He handled himself extremely well. He's a guy who's been a head coach before, mm -hmm. wants to be a head coach again. He's going um, to a program uh, that, talk about that, money. that's rebuilding. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, if, if he's part of a good rebuilding job mm -hmm. at Texas A&M and Buzz Williams, the mm -hmm. former UNO coach, yep. mm -hmm. certainly has an outstanding track record of yes, rebuilding programs. Uh, his, uh, Benford's next step could well be a head coaching position that I think he deserves, especially after the way he handled mm -hmm. the situation at LSU. Who knows, he may be the next head coach at Texas A&M in two years when Bud Williams, Buzz Williams goes to the NCAA and grabs another job. There you go. And it's not, that's not unprecedented, by the way. 100% agree. Benford, it was a no-brainer decision. Mm -hmm. You go with a great, still up-and-coming coach with a program with unlimited resources, staying in the SEC, and his expertise in particular, Benford, is recruiting Texas, considering all those years he spent at North Texas. He wasn't a successful head coach, but I think Les is right. These are the coattails to ride on where he could wind up being a head coach somewhere And, and, and they've coached together at Marquette, so right. they have a relationship, mm -hmm. okay? So, I mean, that's not something unusual. And, uh, wow, what a coach. You know, uh, Mike Vazan, who's with me on Friday on my shows, calls UNO the cradle of coaches. And you're not far off when you look at the coaches that have come through the University of New Orleans. And also on that staff who was brought in by another coach but wound up becoming an assistant for Buzz Williams, Jamie McNeely, former mm -hmm. UNO player, is coming from Virginia Tech now to Texas Tech on that staff. So he could be the next in that long yeah. line. There you go. Um, Nas Reed announces for the, NF, uh, for the NBA draft. I don't think it's a, it, is, it is something that we did not expect, although I will say this, he's not ready for the NBA. No, I think that's uh, one of those uh, instances that we see quite often this time of the year where a uh, player uh, jumps the gun and leaves before he's ready for the NBA. It's unfortunate because I think he's capable of being an NBA player. Mm -hmm. He may wind up being one, but I think if he stayed in college for another mm -hmm. year, 
uh, he would have a better chance of sticking around yeah. the NCAA. Uh, I'm not sure the LSU situation drove him out any sooner than he was already going to go. Yeah. He looked like kind of a one and done he guy was. when he got there. Uh, I, you know, I, I hope it works out for him right. uh, that that he gets in the right situation in the NBA next year and is able to latch on somewhere, or if he has to go to the G League or Europe or whatever. That ultimately. Um, Leaving LSU prematurely doesn't hamper his ability to have a nice professional career. Yeah, uh, Raider is a top 50 player, thought to be, again, a first-rounder. Not a lottery pick, but a first-rounder. But he looks like a guy, to me, that we bounce him from the G League back to the NBA. And at an NBA end of an NBA bench, he probably would get better if he had a chance to be, be with LSU for one more year, no matter who was coaching. Right, he's the classic tweener because as we saw, his outside shot can fail him a little bit too often like mm -hmm. it did in the Sweet 16. He's somebody who's 6'10", who's gotta prove that he can guard on the perimeter. So maybe the G League winds up being where he's going to be. I'm gonna guess he's a second round pick who goes to the G League and, and he will have to develop in that league, which is very wide open. He needs to improve his outside shot and range on it and prove that he can defend different players, different shapes and sizes, because the NBA is looking for versatility. That's the only thing I can say for him on the plus side of going pro, even if he winds up as an up and down G League type guy for a year or two. Yeah. Uh, before we go to break, I want to uh, turn to you for a second. Great year for UNO uh, and, and their college ba and their basketball team. Uh, coach Schlesinger, once again, uh, just a fantastic coach, has built a great program there. Uh, talk a little bit about it. You're the voice of UNO. Talk a little bit about um, Mark Schlesinger and the year that you guys had. Well, the best part of the year is the fact that the team was so young, including Jarrell Gates, who wound up being just the third conference freshman of the year in UNO history, which is saying a lot mm -hmm. over these decades. He's a fantastic building block. Several other freshmen were, were key players in the rotation late in the year and the conference tournament run, which were two big wins over the hottest team in the league, Lamar, under front, former UNO coach Dick Price, that had won nine in a row, and then being able to beat the number one seed, Sam Houston, when they were rested and waiting for you. Just two huge wins, ran out of gas in the final, but key sophomores on the perimeter playing huge minutes throughout the year as well. Only one senior as of right now heading into next year amongst the returnees. So the future very bright under Mark Schlesinger, and they built the team around having as many four-year players that they can develop as possible and what folks have said about it hey at least there's a school in the area that's trying to do it the right way right. And, and and to you who you were at um, Ron Hunter's press conference uh, the new head coach at Tulane for their basketball team your impressions he was a rock star <laughs> he actually <laughs> he he won that room there is as no much doubt. as a coach can win the room now it doesn't matter if you don't win games mm -hmm. but uh, I, I thought he did a great job and he has a very good track record at Georgia State that suggests that, that mm -hmm. he's he's not all flash that there's a lot of substance there at, at Georgia State mm -hmm. six titles mm -hmm. um, three three tournament um, uh, appearances um, uh, they had three regular season uh, titles and three tournament titles pardon me uh, that's fine I, I don't think he'll have any trouble mm -hmm. recruiting players uh, even though you know Tulane standards make it a little bit challenging but you know, there, there are exceptions mm -hmm. that, that you can take advantage of at Tulane. Perry Clark did it expertly. Uh, his successors have not done it quite so well. Mm -hmm. I think this guy is going to understand what he needs to do to take advantage of the um, latitude that he's given to bring in recruits at Tulane. Uh, so I think he'll be able to get players there. I think he'll be able to coach them. Uh, I don't think Tulane could have made a better hire. Right. Bold predictions at that press conference. Going to the NCAA, NCAA next, next season. Year. Uh, Put his thumb that, in Houston's eye. Uh, I don't know uh, why he did uh, that. I don't know why he did that either. Okay, that was the other part. <laughs> and then there was something that really kind of took me back. For a program that's going to have to be de a developing program. Not going to the CBI, not going to CIT. Are you kidding me? You got a chance to go to postseason? You go to postseason. I understand the, what the expectations are to get in the NCAA or the NIT, but you don't turn down an opportunity to go to postseason play. I agree with that from a basketball standpoint. I just think the Tulane University, that, that's not something that uh, the university administration and alumni would, would feel very comfortable about. Mm -hmm. saying Tulane, even though they don't have a great track record in basketball, paying to play in a postseason tournament, uh, I, I, 
I, I don't think that that's something that would be a, a good sell at two. I got to toss it to the I voice of the UN I don't, wanna, I don't want to trample on your toes, but they've been doing that for a lot of years under Lisa Stockton on the women's side. They've been making more choices to go to this, the d WBIs mm -hmm. of the world if they're available, if they're not even WNIT eligible. And that tournament takes 64 teams. I think that if he's put a winning record up there in a year or two and the fans are excited and the attendance is up and he goes behind the scenes and says, I want to be in this tournament, let's pay for it. They'll be in the tournament and he'll use that as a recruiting tool. And yeah. UNO's done it the past couple of years and it, there's no question that it helps you in recruiting. It keeps your name going deeper into March and it says, hey, we're a winning program. I'm not saying to pay for it like West Virginia did when they were 14 and 19 because Bob Huggins was mad at his team finishing last yeah. and wanted him to keep playing, almost to torture them it seems. But if you have a winning record and you've had a good season, and especially if your roster is young and your program hasn't been winning in, in the past few years, I think those tournaments are perfect for it, situations like It's a stepping like stone. That. Yeah, no well, question. It, it helps with player development. Right. You, exactly. you get to practice and play mm -hmm. more. And I agree. Loyola, Chicago, Nevada, mm -hmm. examples of right. teams who made deep runs in those tournaments, and the next thing you know, they're in the top 25 or the Final Four. And, and I agree. It, it's not etched in stone. Right. No. <laughs> no. Like, would you say, say the press that video tape right, exactly. that coming? No. No, 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 no doubt. doubt. No doubt. No doubt about it. Les East and uh, Jude Young are our guests today from CrescentCitySports.com. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Quick break. We come back. We'll talk some Saints. We'll talk some Pelicans as well. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports. air conditioning, heating, and refrigeration has been family owned and operated since 1989. Burkhart has energy efficient solutions and offers brands such as Mitsubishi ductless AC units and Amena, the only manufacturer with a lifetime unit replacement warranty. Burkhart's offers maintenance bundle packages that include servicing your AC, generator, and tankless water heater. For more information on the services Burkhart's provides, visit acpromise.com. Burkhart's Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration, providing comfort for life. Located at 3701 Iberville Street in Mid-City is Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Open seven days a week, Katie's offers daily specials for lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Serving New Orleans cuisine such as fried shrimp platters, grilled redfish, and a fully stocked bar. And don't forget about our expanded event seating and local entertainment. Featured on the best of food networks, diners, drive-ins, and dives, Katie's Restaurant and Bar. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. I'm your host, Eric Asher. Tonight, Jude Young and Les East of CrestySports.com are our guests. Guys, I would normally go with the Saints at this point, but i got to go to the Pelicans here, especially after what happened last night in the Smoothie King Center, the loss to the uh, Hornets. Uh, this season is miserably, this miserable season is coming to an end very, very quickly. Uh, Anthony Davis is being um, uh, ripped by a fan on the way out. He gives the fan the middle finger. Now, I talked about it extensively on my, on my radio show today. You know, he kind of gave the fans and, and, and the city the mingle, middle finger right before the trading deadline, right? So, I mean, that's kind of like full circle here. What blows me away about this is, and look, again, I'm not taking up for the heckler here. You know, there's a line that you can cross with an athlete. Uh, but then again, at the other the other part of it is it's an athlete. He's an entertainer. Uh, entertainers get heckled, heckled heckled all the time. It's part of the deal you live with. You don't want it to get personal. Sometimes it does, and we've seen situations where it's gotten personal. And 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 the um, uh, the teams, the clubs, the franchises have, have have done what they needed to do to um, get rid of that particular fan or, or ban that particular fan from from coming to, um, to to games. But what did he think? Did he think all of a sudden that he was going to get a bouquet of love on the way out? You know, th this is kind of silly in seven ways from Sunday. Um, the, by the way, he got fined fifteen thousand right. dollars from the NBA. Oh, that's really going to hurt gonna him. It's going to be right? devastating <laughs> to Anthony Davis. On top of that killer fifty thousand yes. dollars fine for uh, right. forcing yeah. a trade. Right? Yeah, he's he's going to be a pauper. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, Anthony has to know better that fans are not going to take kindly to the rejection that he gave to them and to the city. On the other hand, you know, fans can cross the line. I don't know exactly what happened here, but I would assume if Anthony, he's a pretty mild-mannered sure. guy, if he gave him the guy the finger, probably something uh, unpleasant was said and inappropriate. And, uh, and, and I think we need to police that to whatever it did, sure. you know. So, 
you know, I don't think there's any clean hands here on either side. But the other thing is, if you're going to have that kind of attitude toward Anthony Davis, where was that when they played the Timberwolves back in right. <laughs> late January when he asked for the trade? Why do you wait for this game against Charlotte? The penultimate home game yeah, of this your disastrous shot. season. Right. What could possibly have you so worked up mm -hmm. at this point? And that Minnesota game, you know, he got booed when the game started, and then he scores like 10 points in a row, and all of a sudden they love him again. Right. So, I mean, the whole thing is fickle to begin with. But it's, you know, it's nobody has completely clean hands here. It's, it's a nice, interesting diversion mm -hmm to the uh, ending of an uh, utterly forgettable season. Yeah, nightmare. When I heard about this, my, my reaction was, I think Davis probably was surprised because you mentioned it, it's gone all the way back to late January, this saga that's yes. gone on, and he's been at these games playing part-time or sitting on the end of the bench and street clothes, not wanting to be here, everybody knowing he's going to leave and is forcing his way out, and finally this happens so late in the game. I think that's a credit to most Pelicans fans, the ones who are still showing up at right. the arena, that they are behaving themselves, because I think Davis was surprised that one fan went irate and started ripping into him no matter what that fan said. Sure, Davis should have kept his cool, but I think he was probably shocked because after he was booed that first game back mm -hmm. in the lineup after the All-Star game, it's been, at least, it's been at least indifferent, yes. if not a love yeah. fest. So maybe he was yeah. a little shocked. And again, it does seem like he's somebody who's not only thin-skinned, but uh, a little bit misguided and, and easily led in the wrong directions, which is why this thing happened in the yeah. first place. Maybe this fan is not a season ticket holder and a friend gave him these tickets, mm -hmm. and this is his first opportunity yeah. to let to Anthony let him, know what he thought. Exactly what he thought, right. So who well, knows? maybe he is a season ticket holder and is very upset by the fact that he bought season tickets and the actions of Anthony Davis doing this the wrong way and trying to force his way out of, out of town imploded the season. Okay, and, and you know, no playoffs and, and a bunch of losing um, games and watching, quite frankly, a bunch of G League players playing, playing for, for the NBA franchise. Guys, let's shift gears to the future now. There is too many rumors out there right now to ignore that Danny Ferry is not going to be the president of basketball operations for the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, there are other, other candidates that are being um, interviewed. David Griffin, the former Cohevan Cavalier um, uh, general manager. I got to believe if Ferry's here, Griffin is not uh, because he's going to want total control. Golden State Director of Player Personnel Larry Harris. Uh, Brooklyn Nets Assistant General Manager Trajan Langdon, uh, uh, Houston um, Rockets Executive Vice President of uh, Basketball Operation Gerson Rojas, uh, Washington, Ritters, uh, Washington Wizards pardon me, Acting General Manager Tommy Shepard, and of course the aforementioned Danny Ferry. Um, I have been on the record of saying a new broom needs to sweep clean. The Benson Ownership Organization has always been one that leans on, I'm comfortable, I'm familiar with an individual, so again, I want to retain that individual. Nobody is disputing Danny Ferry's abilities in terms of running an NBA franchise. He did a nice job in Cleveland, he did a fantastic job in resurrecting, resurrecting the Atlanta Hawks before, again, uh, the email and the situation with, with the quote-unquote racial comments. Uh, I'll start with you first, Jude. Uh, fan base can get behind Danny Ferry if, the, if ultimately he is named as, as the president of basketball operations and they hire one of these young GMs to, to kind of uh, learn under him? I don't think the fans want to see that. I don't think the fans want to see anything from the old. Like you said, it has to be a fresh start. And that's no offense to Danny no. Ferry, who had an issue in the past that had nothing to do with his ability to Absolutely. identify players that cost him being in this type of position that he's still working his way back from making that error. But I just don't see fans buying that. I think they want to see not only a new face, but I think the Pelicans would be wise to lean towards the best young face out of that group, somebody who brings that kind of energy who comes from the new school background of playing the game the way we're seeing it around the league where people are spreading the floor, shooting the three, and playing up tempo. That's what the head coach, Alvin Gentry, has been trying to do. Now, you can complain about when he has a full arsenal of players, how he's used his rotations and his late game groupings all you want, but at least he's trying to implement what has become what the NBA
NBA is all about. They need a GM who built a team that way and is consistent with it. And I think they need to go with a young, fresh face who, uh, and, and people like Langdon and Rosas really fit yes. that as well. But you've got to give those guys full control so they can implement their plan. You don't bring those guys in and say because they're young, you're going to keep an eye on them because they're inexperienced. Whoever it is has to have full control because the other side of the building, it's Saints and Pelicans, other side of the building really doesn't know anything about basketball. So let the guy you hire to be in charge of basketball do his job. Your thoughts? Well, there are a few things um, here. One, as far as the fans' reception, I, I agree that they would not be fired up by Danny Ferry, but it doesn't matter. This, the, that, this hiring is going to be seen through the prism of how good a trade they make with Anthony sure. Davis. You make a blockbuster trade. All's forgiven. Everybody loves you. Right. You, you look like you get fleeced in the trade or don't get nearly mm -hmm. what you should get. Then it doesn't matter who you are coming in. That, that, that's it. They're not going to be on your side. So that, that part is going to be determined by the trade. As for the Benson family... I'm not sure Mr. Benson's track record translates precisely to Mrs. Benson. Mm -hmm. True. I, I've really been impressed with that. I way. have as well. I think she's embraced this role, mm -hmm. and I think she's finding her way, leaning on the people around her, and making the decisions that make sense to her. So I, I'm not sure that you can <clears throat> anticipate what she might do based on what mm -hmm. her husband did in the past. Danny Ferry I don't think would be a bad choice. I think he's a competent general manager, probably better than competent. Mm -hmm. uh, if he's the guy, this is a strong field of candidates that's out there. Yes. If he's better than what's out there, you should have figured that out in the last three years. You shouldn't have had to have this search no to doubt. go out. So to me, if you're going out and throwing this wide open and looking at all these mm -hmm. young hot shots, then you've determined that Danny Ferry's not clearly the guy you need to have. And so I think, I think it will right. be somebody from the outside. And there has been speculation that he really doesn't want the job full time, that again, he lives in Atlanta, he's got a family in Atlanta, that again, they came out and said that he was truly a part-time guy, kind of maybe doing a little line of separation between him and Dell Demps. Uh, and that maybe again, he's here for a couple years, uh, and then that young GM takes over the entire organization. I also, again, it's been speculated that you know, they, they may not be comfortable with one of these young guys making a deal for Anthony Davis, mm -hmm. and they feel more comfortable with the savvy guy that's done it before in Danny Ferry to make this deal and, and then to go forward. Your Familiarity thoughts? could go beyond that, too, because you mentioned we don't know exactly how Gail Benson's going to run mm -hmm. things versus Tom, but even though the, the loyal lieutenants around don't really know anything about basketball, they take on a lot of business interest, and it's growing, and they tend to want to have their say and their hands at least somewhat in that. If you bring in somebody new, I'm not saying that these people are going to feel threatened, but this new person could come in and be a great success and gain favor like we saw Mickey Loom over two decades mm -hmm. gave a great True. has a great deal of favor obviously that has been passed from Tom to Gale so maybe they would feel more comfortable if they like and have gotten along with Danny Ferry to the point where it could give him a leg up and he could be the guy that wouldn't surprise me at all I just think they should go with a completely fresh start not only for the fans but because I'd love to see somebody who's younger from a winning organization who's been doing it the way that the league has turned in the last decade mm -hmm. I just wonder why would one of these young hotshot GMs come to New Orleans if they knew ultimately I'm answering to Danny Ferry? Well, I don't think they would unless it was uh, clearly a short-term thing. Right. In, in whatever way it manifests in itself, if the plan were to be essentially Danny makes the trade and then turns it over to a young mm -hmm. hotshot, that I think could work. If, if it's understood mm -hmm. in the beginning that right. this young person is going to be taking over in the near so future. So the transition guy and then eventually you're taking, it, it's your baby. Right. right. I, I mean, I don't want a, an analytics guy mm -hmm. coming in and sitting across from Danny Ainge trying to make this trade. But I might want him running the front office mm -hmm. for the next few years. And then the other, David Griffin, I, from what I'm hearing, his, 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 his contract... Yeah, the money he's going to want yeah. is probably more than they're willing to pay and probably more than he's worth, yeah, frankly. I would agree. Um, so I don't know that he's a viable candidate. But if, if somehow there's a transition period whereby Ferry makes the trade and a young guy takes over in the not-too-distant future, I think that, that makes sense. 
Guys, uh, you mentioned Gail Benson. Uh, her comments um, about saying there's no way she's selling the Pelicans, um, that uh, she values the Pelicans as much as the Saints. Again, we, that needs to be determined. Uh, but that she also doesn't look at herself as the owner of the team. She feels like it's an asset that she's protecting for the city. Les, you and I have been around a long time. We've seen, uh, we've seen uh, the owners of all these teams here, here in New Orleans since the professional sports came to the city. We've never heard that. Certainly not from Sam Battistone. No. Yeah. <laughs> Who, when, by when the way, he, was when the, he packed up the Jazz and moved right. him to Salt Lake City. That's Street. right. Uh, or John Meekham when he was landing at Jacksonville with Bum Phillips. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. In that helicopter. Uh, I'm really impressed by those statements. And um, I think that's great. I, I think she seems to have a real soft spot in her heart for the Pelicans. Not that they're necessarily the equal of the Saints, mm -hmm. but I think that she has more of an, you know, I think Mr. Benson bought them to save them for the city, kind of like he did for the Saints, but I mean, it wasn't a public trust right. with the Pelicans the way it is with the Saints. And I, I just think that she has a stronger connection to the basketball right. she franchise. she was there. Right. That's the key. She wasn't there in the mid-80s, right. right. but she was there for this purchase. And from we understand, mm -hmm. she was the one that pushed him, at least that's the narrative they put out there, to buy the Pelicans. Right. She's come up with a color scheme. She helped get the nickname. I mean, all this stuff. So mm -hmm. she's kind of invested in it as well. Uh, you know, Tom Benson wanted to take this team to San Antonio. She's saying, I'm protecting the city's asset. She also goes on to say that, again, there will be a succession plan to make sure that these teams stay in New Orleans. Again, something we did not, not ever hear from Battistone, from, from Meekum, nor from Tom Benson. And you know what the difference is? Even though Tom Benson was a New Orleanian, he did have interest in a life in sure. San Antonio. Gail Benson is born and raised and always been a New Orleanian. And she's now in her early 70s mm -hmm. and she has everything she could ever want in life. And she's basically said so. Mm -hmm. And she would like to be the best she can be for this community. She wanted her husband to be that way. And that's why he was so giving in his late years after they were together and got married. I completely believe everything that she has said publicly in interviews. I believe that she's genuine about mm -hmm. it. I think the fans do too. And if they simply win and have stability on both sides of the house, the Saints have that right now. If the Pelicans can get there, I think the fan base locally will respond as much because of her and believing in her yeah. as anything else that could happen with the New Orleans Pelicans. Totally. I believe in, mm -hmm. in Gail Benson, and I think most people feel the same way. I do, too. And, and one other thing, Alvin Gentry said about this time last year when they were making the playoff run, mm -hmm. she was making every road game yeah. late in the regular mm -hmm. season and the playoffs. She was having lunch with the coaching staff, mm -hmm. going to practice. I mean, she was invested right. in the success of that team during the playoff run last year. And I think she's similarly invested uh, emotionally in, in the success of this um, basketball team. And I, I think that's what she meant by her statement, that she doesn't see it as being the owner of a business, mm -hmm. but she's the person in, entrusted yes. with this asset for the community. And, and I not, think that's all you should ever ask of any owner. Agree. And not once did she leave to go to a concert like DeMarcus Cousins. She actually went to every game. There you go. <laughs> all right, guys, let me throw some names out to you. Jared Cook, um, Malcolm Brown, Mario uh, Edwards Jr., Latavius Murray, Nick Easton, the re-signing of Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, also, again, P.J. Williams re-signs with this team now. Um, the uh, uh, punt returner from, uh, from uh, Marcus Minnesota. Sherrills. Uh, Sherrills. Uh, I'll take you first. Your thoughts on free agency thus far? I, I love what they've done because they responded to a need that I don't think was going, something they thought was going to be a need, which was replacing Mark Ingram, and they did so quickly. I think Ingram and his agent made a big mistake, and they should still be here, but it is what it is. Latavius Murray's a good running back and a good complement to uh, Kamara, and he's proven in the NFL. But the need they knew going in was the defensive tackle spot. They absolutely had to get guys that were proven in this league that could play, and by getting Mar uh, Malcolm Brown and uh, getting Mario Edwards. They got players who are versatile, who can fit their scheme, that can help them just in case they don't get anything from Sheldon mm -hmm. Rankins this upcoming season. They may not even get half a season out of him at this point, right. coming back from the Achilles, and we don't know mm -hmm. how much time 
early on that David Onyemata may miss because of a potential suspension mm -hmm. for the off-field issue. So they had to address that. <coughs> You've got to be good in the middle of the line. Uh, so they've been offensive in free agency when they've needed to, uh, to f improve areas that they've needed to, that they knew going in. And they've been able to respond quickly and react with Mark Ingram, with the retirement of, of Max Unger to grab a guy like Nick mm -hmm. Easton. But cross your fingers, he has to stay healthy. Yes. Folks who are worried about that, though, remember, Unger, when he came over in the trade for Jimmy Graham, injuries were a real concern yes, with were. him, and it, and it worked out. So you have to take those risks sometimes. I just like what they've done across the board. Uh, you can't stand still. Just because they were in the NFL's Final Four and should have been in the Final Two, you've got to keep trying to get better. And because they're so limited with the draft, mm -hmm. they've been aggressive to get better in free agency, and they still have some money to spend if they want to keep yep. going. Your thoughts? Uh, I think they've done a very good job. I think we should also mention uh, Mickey Loomis did a good job restructuring yes. Drew Brees and Cameron Meredith mm -hmm. to free up some True. money. I don't think they get Jared Cook if Drew doesn't redo his mm -hmm. contract. Uh, so that was significant. The only negative is not being able to retain Mark Ingram. Yep. Uh, I think there was seemed like there was probably some uh, communications issues well, that's, that have been that, that, there. That really and, blows my mind, though, doesn't yeah. it, Les? I mean, the relationship that that uh, Peyton had with Mark Ingram, for him not to return calls. I mean, the guy went instant messenger, went text and phone call, and no return of a call? Yeah, I, 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 that was a mistake. I, I don't understand why that happened. I think, as you, I think we're getting at, uh, I think Mark and his agent uh, had an inflated expectation sure. on the open market. Uh, but the, Sa the Saints could not wait True. On Mark Ingram, if they were going to replace him, they had to grab Latavius Murray mm -hmm. right away. They moved quickly, decisively, made a good move to mitigate the loss once it happened. Not sure Murray's as good a player as Ingram, but he's as good as they could have done. Mm -hmm. I think that was a, a good deal to mitigate the loss. I think they put themselves in a position now, even though they're limited in the draft, they freed themselves up by addressing tight end primarily, but also the defensive line and the center position after the retirement. So now they're just dealing with depth issues going forward. And the draft, <coughs> I think that they can just go for the best player with each pick, regardless of position, because they, they've addressed everything so well, despite their limitations and free agents. 30 seconds each. What's left? What do they need to do for agency or draft positions to fill? Well, I think once we get to the draft, what the Saints are going to do is trade from the future again. I think 2020 picks are going to be used as ammo for mm -hmm. 2019. They're not just going to sit there. They're going to be aggressive on the draft board and try to come up with at least a couple of players in the first couple of rounds that can help them right away. Then after that, you can respond. That second wave of free agency, a veteran or two here or there, whether it's an experienced hand at wide receiver, mm -hmm. maybe a veteran cornerback to give them something a little bit more on the outside. Okay. They're pretty set at the nickel spot. Those are areas you can look at. Wide receiver, tight end, secondary. Right. Depth in I, all three areas. I've got wide receiver, three technique defensive tackle, okay, because again, you bring Malcolm Brown in, as you mentioned, you don't know what you're going to get out of Sheldon Rankins. I still think you need that. I would say, again, you're going to have to do some of the defensive end, you know, because, again, you still need a rotation player there, even if Marcus Davenport comes back and plays very, very good. And I still think, unless, you know, Josh Laribius is still out there, but you need a swing offensive lineman. Right. They can play multiple positions for you. Doesn't that have to be a veteran? I, I think, think it has to has be. To be. And Absolutely. You, and you mentioned tight end because they have Josh Hill in there as yes. the, the jack of all trades. Don't be surprised if even that second round pick they have right now winds up being another young tight end mm -hmm. because I wouldn't be surprised if they'd like to play with more tight ends on the field and have that diversity. And you know Sean Payton, he likes to tweak. He likes right. to change and have new wrinkles every season. He's going to be 33. I right. Yeah, exactly. 33. You've got to get a young tight end. Yeah. You know, and again, uh, you know, look, we'll, we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk. Uh, New Orleans guy, Late, um, uh, middle round, Foster Murrow might be a nice, nice pickup for the Saints. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Jude Young, Les East, always great. Thanks so much for being on our panel. This was as good a discussion as we've ever had on this program. Thanks for being with us. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, there's a rebroadcast this program each and every Friday night right here on WLAE TV at 10 p.m. Also on Pelican Sports Television. That's 9 p.m every Friday night statewide. Catch me on the radio, Sports 1280, 101.1 FM HD2 on the iHeartRadio app. You can listen live, download the podcast at ericasher.com. That is weekdays, noon to two. Also, uh, next week, we'll have Mike DeChilier. He'll do his draft show with us. That'll be next Thursday night, so stay tuned for that. And also want to give thanks to our guests tonight, uh, Les East and Jude Young, also to the WLE production staff, including Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, 
uh, Alex Chacon, Naila Jones, and my director, William Hill. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Eric Asher. Have a great week, and we'll see you right back here next week for another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports.